Uh, and now, really, uh, thanks, Kevin, for being with us. Thanks for your patience also. Uh, uh, you are really an expert uh, in uh, the combat against human trafficking. You are, as I mentioned, member of the GRETA, which is very effective. Uh, and uh, um, we are very much looking forward to listening to you. You, you have the floor, Kevin. Thank you, Michel, and uh, thank you for inviting me today. And uh, also, congratulations on this series that you've uh, run over the last year. It's been uh, remarkable. I want to start really just taking a few words from our previous presenters, from uh, Fausto and from Alan. Alan. Um, neglected crime, I think, is what Professor Fausto said. And that really sums this up. It is definitely a neglected crime something that is marginalized. And why is it marginalized? Because it affects marginalized people and it's not important. And we all profit somewhere from this existence. I think uh, Alan as well talked about what I would sum up as outsourcing, that states outsource their responsibility. And I couldn't agree with him more. This is a state's responsibility. This is something that states should put together and have formidable measures in place to prevent it. The suppression is preventing it to support victims and to prosecute. And if we look at globally, this crime is estimated in 2014, the ILO said it was creating 150 billion US dollars a year. And yet, if you look across OECD countries, it's very hard to reach a billion dollars a year fighting this. So less than 0.75% is actually fighting this global crime. But then also this crime is entwined with legitimate economies. As we hear, you know, businesses, whether they're in East Africa, whether they're in Latin America, whether they're in the UK or across Europe or Australia. Legitimate companies are benefiting from the exploitation of people who are elsewhere in the world. And that's something we need to fight. And of course, if we look at the laws, we have the Palermo Protocol that's been around for 22 years. We've got the Council of Europe Convention that's now around since 2008. Uh, we've got commitments at the G20. We've got commitments last year at the G7. We've got commitments at the UN. We've got the OSCE commitments, EU uh, uh, directives. And yet nothing is really happening. Criminals are operating with impunity and making 150 billion a year while 40 million people suffer. That in itself should be a wake up call to the world and to states. And you know, as a former police officer and running trafficking teams, I used to get people say to me all the time, it's really difficult. It's really difficult. It's frustrating. The, crew, the, the victims, they won't cooperate. So let's blame the victims, shall we? Because they won't cooperate, there's nothing we can do about it. Actually, I used to investigate murders. When I investigated murders, a victim never spoke to me, but I still used to convict. When I investigated drugs crime, drugs never speaks. So the commodity in trafficking is a human life. Just remember that it's a human life. And if 10 kilos of heroin was coming into the country, you would get helicopters, firearms, as many officers as you want. If a van load of people who were destined to work on a building site were coming into the country, you might get an immigration officer doing a stop. And that's the reality. And we need to understand that. And that's why we're failing. We're not putting the resources. We're not using the technical resources of policing. We're not using the state's ability to prosecute. We're not doing what Alan said about this being a state responsibility, like having a war crimes unit or like having terrorism. And the funny thing is, we know that human trafficking funds terrorism. Women were being sold in Libya to fund terrorism in uh, in uh, northern Iraq and a partnership that I drew up with other countries, we managed to get sanctions on the people who were benefiting. 
But why is it we're not doing things like that all the time? And when people used to say to me, victims will never talk to you, I proved them wrong time and time and time and time again. If victims are treated properly and you have professional people debriefing them and they get what they're promised and what they're told they will get, they start to trust you. They start to trust the people who are protecting them, the people who are looking after them, the police officers, the state. But if they're like in the moment at the UK where they might be waiting two to four years for a decision on a national referral mechanism, and there's 30,000 in that queue ahead of them, they're not going to trust the state. If they get shipped off to somewhere where there's nothing that's actually helping them to get better, they're not going to trust the state. They're not going to trust anybody. So you can do this, and we can do this properly, but it needs dedicated, well-resourced professionals who are funded by the state, assisted by NGOs. I worked with NGOs in many ways, and it was the professionalism and that extra added value that NGOs could bring, particularly when dealing with vulnerable victims and religious sisters, had this way of giving compassion to victims that police officers just don't naturally ooze. And one case I did, in the morning we raided a premises. By the afternoon, because of the love and care of the victims, to the victims, the victims were telling us the whole account. And we managed to catch the traffickers and the rapists of children. So we need to think better. But across the world in 2020, 9,800 prosecutions mounted for human trafficking by states out of 40 million potential crimes. That's nothing. It is nothing. In one state alone, there'll be more than 10,000 prosecutions for drugs. That's for sure. But across the whole world, 9,876 prosecutions mounted for human trafficking, 150 billion US dollars and 40 million people. And that's all we can produce. But if I told you in 2015, there was 19,000 prosecutions. And yet we keep hearing that we're doing better. Well, we're not. The facts show it. These facts from the US State Department. We're not doing better. But we also need to look. Things like the Palermo Protocol in the year 2000, we were all scared that the Internet was going to crash as we went into the year 2000 and that all our computers were going to fail. So think where you were in the year 2000 and think where we are now in 2022. Communications, technology, the way we travel the world, the way that trade has changed. And yet we're still trying to look at this in isolation to an individual area. The victims need to be supported locally and be given that support. The crimes need to be investigated and all avenues and areas looked at. And I remember running investigations where the next thing were we were working in four or five countries. And that wouldn't just be in Europe, it may be in Asia. And the same network was connected. Now, it was hard. It was tough. But as a professional police officer, it was exactly what I wanted to be doing. And my teams wanted to be doing it. It was the empowerment of leadership. And the Santa Marta Group, which some of you may know, is a union of civil society, police, and Catholic bishops and religious sisters. And it comes together to have that strength. And I'll give you a little story of how that works. Yes, it's got a big strategy plan it wants to work on. Yes, it wants to influence the UN. Yes, it wants to influence the G20 and governments and other agencies and supply chain transparency. But when I had a case of a Nigerian woman and the trial was going to collapse because we couldn't find a witness who we knew had gone back to Nigeria. And she was being accused of being some sort of uh, rogue person. If I had done through the official channels, it would have taken me six months, a year. The trial would have collapsed. I picked up the phone for the religious sisters in Nigeria and they found the person for me in two hours. So operating at strategic levels, bringing in plans, but making sure it works on the ground 
is crucial. And then I think we need people like what Professor Fasdo has said, bringing this to the international courts. Why is it we haven't had this at the international courts? So working with Santa Marta Group and working on the global stage, there's six things that I've said we need to do to change the culture and to change our approach to human trafficking. And within it all is a core that states need to protect victims. That's a given. And they need to set up national referral mechanisms that are effective, that support victims, that give them the right to legal aid, that gives them the right to compensation, that brings in the non-prosecution element, that gives them leave to remain and to stay in a country if necessary. All of those things should be automatic and work systemically. But the other things I think we need to do is firstly, we need to look at global procurement. The G20 com committed to making sure that procurement and government buying would be free of modern slavery, something that I pushed for. And that one in every five dollars around the world is spent by a government. Well, if we made sure that money was clean and it wasn't funding human trafficking, we're going a long way to clean things up. Look at the procurement of the US, the UK, Australia, Germany. And Germany's bringing in new legislation that's going to be a step towards that next year. But then we need to also look at tainted money, a term I've been talking about, tainted money. And I don't mean small amounts of money, but I mean a business. And it can be a small business. If you have profited out of slavery, we should make it a given that we do not want slavery money circulating around the world. That was one of the big things, how they combated the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade. And if you look at the famous letter that President Lincoln sent to the people of Manchester in England, because the people in the cotton industry wouldn't buy cotton from the southern states of the United States, or at that time, not the United States, but of the southern states, because that was funding the, the civil uh, uprising. And it was also slavery and the cotton industry that was getting the money. So once the people stopped buying the cotton from the main plant of the world, which was Manchester in the UK, and these were working class people, it brought down the slave trade in the US. And President Lincoln famously wrote a letter to the people of Manchester, thanking them for their efforts. And they were the people, people on the ground, people in poverty, working class people actually played a role in that. So we need to think about this tainted money and just not have it. We don't want it. We don't want anyone to profit from this abuse. It's so awful and abhorrent. The next thing we need to do is we have the internet. And the internet talks all about free speech. I was at an event in the Vatican with the big internet companies and they said, but it's free speech. And I said, but you can't go in the middle of the street and abuse a child. You can't go down the road and start shouting obscenities outside someone's house. But you can have a computer inside someone's house in a child's room and these acts can happen. Or it can be out in the Philippines and people can buy sex online. Or you can have all this pornography on there of children or people who are being trafficked and you can recruit on it. And I said, you companies are earning hundreds of billions a year in profit. You have got the ability to reinvest that and stop this online. You can actually, and they talked about free speech. And I said, don't ever talk about free speech when you're talking about child safety and child abuse. You cannot justify child abuse by saying it's free speech. It just doesn't work. So we need to legislate. They talked about, they brought in apps and they're doing schools programs. So the problem on the internet is now an app for a parent, a busy parent to understand how to not to stop this on their phone or their computer, and for a busy school teacher who should be teaching. The responsibility sits with the internet providers, businesses, and governments need to be strong enough and ethical enough to legislate and make sure that these companies do not profit from this form of exploitation and trafficking online. The next thing we need to do, the fourth thing, is look at the instruments 
the slavery legislation back to the 1926, I think it is, the Slavery Convention, and use them, but modernize them. As Professor Fausto has seen, how can we use those in the international courts? How can we actually use that? Let's start getting those cases where we're holding people responsible as we would with terrorism or other serious crimes. And let's start looking at the businesses, their supply chains. Why is it we say it's too hard for a business to identify their supply chain when we can fly from London to Australia now? We can do all of these things. We heard about the, you know, the exploitation that's happening in West Africa. And, you know, we have the tyre industry, which is making billions of dollars, and yet it's not investing back in its home countries where it's being grown. So let's start to look at the legislation and use it effectively. But this needs to be done by states, as was said by Alain. The next thing we need to do is engage, as this event is, engage with the international bodies, the UN, the ILO, the IOM, and start to shape what they're doing. Start to make sure that they're acting properly. They're not just doing campaigns, but that something comes out of it. You know, when, when we get another convention signed, how can we make sure that convention is delivered? How can we say to our elected, democratically elected governments, you signed that? You ratified that. You ratified the Council of Europe Convention, yet you're not delivering on it. Why not? But we need to work with like the World Health Organization, all these big international bodies. And just like Michel Vuthi's done, using their network to inform and start to get interest. And the final one, the sixth one, is we need to reset the moral compass. That may sound unachievable. But we need to start talking in plain English that this is unacceptable. We want to see the criminals face justice, even if that's a big multinational company. We want to see the legislation like the US Tariff Act used, which they have been using very, uh, very effectively for the last few years around stopping trade. Uh, where there's slavery and not buying from countries where there's slavery. We want to see the UK Modern Slavery Act toughened up, the Australian Modern Slavery Act toughened up. We want to see the German legislation in action. We want to see the EU directives in action because that's all about the moral compass. That's all about doing what's right. For that person that I started off talking about, the marginalised how often do we really think about the person who we will never meet? The person we will never meet who today is packing our food, the person who is sewing our clothes, the person who is up getting the rubber for our tires. Now, Germany has going a long way on their new legislation. And it was quite a high level entry at 466 million euros a year to be uh, catched in it or caught in it, but that will go down year on year. But let's start to understand that. Let's start to talk about prevention. Prevention is always better. When they build a tower block in the United States, or whether it's in Thailand, they have fire exits, they have dry risers, so water can get to the top. And thankfully, we don't get many high rises, high rise buildings, very tragic ones have happened, whereby people aren't safe. Well, that's what we need to do with modern slavery and human trafficking. We need to make systems where it can't happen. And if it does happen, you'll get caught. And if you get caught, you're going to face justice. And that justice may include jail time, but also it will mean that those people that you've exploited will be get reparation. And that reparation will come from any profits you've made first off. So until we start to talk about this, as this uh, event has been, like terrorism, like war crimes, and we start to get responsibilities of the states and uh, across the world, and they start investing at least 150 billion US dollars a year to counter that money. And if we start going after that money, that 150 billion US dollars will become legitimate money because people won't be using it for slavery. So we need to think about it on a much more organized international level. But always remember, 
that at the end of this, there's a life that's being destroyed and we need to make sure that everything we do also supports them. So thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much, Kevin. It's very powerful what you you said, also uh, very concrete, uh, very uh, <clears throat> so, very useful. Uh, actually, I, I see four questions. I don't know whether uh, possibly I will read them briefly, and uh, <clears throat> whoever Kevin or, or you, Fausto, if you want to answer them, uh, please feel free because. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Normally, we have uh, 20 more minutes. And uh, so first question is uh, workers uh, in uh, the condition of slavery in agriculture and uh, mentioning especially in Italy. So workers in agriculture. And, and then I would just say that uh, actually there was a, a report before the Human Rights Council precisely on this category of, uh, of victims. Uh, and that was discussed last week in Geneva. Second question, porn companies, pornography companies are protected and uh, are better protected than children. Uh, that's the second question. The third is about uh, the purchase of human organs for medical reasons. Is there any ethical restriction uh, uh, to safeguard the purchase of human organs? Of course. Uh, Kevin, you could speak also about uh, this uh, uh, Council of Europe Convention Against uh, Human Trafficking. And then the fourth question is uh, from Professor Elman Mad, uh, a friend from Morocco. Uh, thank you, uh, Khalifa, for being with us. Uh, the gap between the law and its implementation is due to the ignorance of this law by many law practitioners. Uh, there are <laughs> actually trained in private law, but not so much uh, in uh, anything dealing with uh, human trafficking. So I don't know who would like to, to start answering. Possibly, Kevin, would you uh, like to pick up one or two questions? Please, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. I'll, um, I'll start on the agricultural sector. And this is a big problem. And really, it feeds into... Uh, and, uh, you know, another question that was there really about companies. And, you know, we have this situation where uh, migrant workers generally, and they may be migrant workers from within the EU. So, you know, there was a lot of problems in Italy with people from Romania. So it's not automatically people who are undocumented. Um, and companies are, you know, buying and, you know, they will do lots of checks on the quality of the goods, but not on the quality of the care of the staff. And, you know, until they are properly held to account for that and they keep saying to us, well, you know, that will make things more expensive. Well, firstly, that's our choice if we want that. But the second thing is it doesn't always make things. And there's organizations like the Institute of Human Rights and Business who have shown that if you've got a good workforce and they're well paid and, you know, agricultural workers are never going to get top salaries. They're always going to be lower paid, unskilled workers. But if they're paid properly and they're given bank accounts, they can really contribute to communities. And if we look at, you know, over the years, as people have moved, you know, my own family, Irish, went to America and then to the UK and then back to Ireland. It was all about economic movements. And once you could, you know, my grandparents and my parents, once they got enough money and then they went back and they built their own houses and then they that's how communities work. And, you know, businesses and migrant workers are always, you know, shortchanged, literally, but then they can't get bank accounts. They've got no workers' rights. We need to work on that. We need to hold companies accountable. Your second point about organs, there are very strict rules around the world. And the World Health Organization and Dr. Frank Delmonico, who is the, the lead for organ uh, uh, transplants for the World Health Organization, has done so much work on this. There are policies, there's very strict rules in most countries uh, uh, around organs. Um, but what you do end up with is, you know, some countries and EU countries don't have donor policies at all. And so then what you end up with is that wealthy people from those regions who can't get an organ in their own jurisdiction or uh, for example, they may have been refused an organ in their own jurisdiction because they're too, you know, too, they're, they're not medically suitable. 
they will travel uh, to some places, and it's been known to happen in Egypt, you know, India, uh, some places in Africa, um, whereby then somebody donates an organ. And, of course, it's not done in proper conditions. It's not done with uh, uh, proper follow-up and proper drugs. And if we look now, uh, you know, the media reports and the, and, and the things I've seen firsthand, actually, of people coming from Afghanistan who have sold an organ, and families are doing it, and it's a big trade down there. And, you know, the last Santa Mota group, we saw it firsthand on some photos about organs being sold in Mozambique. So, yes, it is a... Uh, it's well regulated within the regulated sector, like everything, it can be regulated. And, you know, doctors aren't going to get involved in this, but then you've got this rogue area. But going back to where we were and where I was talking and all three presenters have said, there isn't the investment in justice, in the state. And, uh, you know, um, if this is state sponsored in some regions or it's being done on a, on a you know, a, a size, a very large size, this should be something that should be looked at from the International Criminal Court because someone will die, the donor will die and the recipient will die. Uh, and Frank Don Monaco explains that far better than I could. And if I, if I could add there, Michel, to yep. Fausto's point is that... Um, Investing in awareness with, uh, uh, not just awareness, awareness is one thing, but as you say, first, the training of judges and law enforcement officials and those people, you know, who are in critical positions who may be able to uh, see this, but also counter it and prevent it. Um, so prevention goes much wider than, than, than the criminal justice system. Investment in those is critical. And that will take a number of years and it needs a policy approach. Um, but what I see all the time where I go is uh, is outsourcing. And I will see that, you know, a country says we've trained 100 police officers or 200 or 300 police officers. And then I ask the question, well, how many police officers have you got? And they say 130,000. You know, and every police officer will be trained in other crimes, you know, and every police officer, for example, in the UK will have training on terrorism and what you should do at a terrorist incident or a death, a murder or other serious crime. The chances of a police officer coming across terrorism in their service is almost, you know, negligible. Some areas more likely, but actually it's negligible in the more rural areas and even a murder. It's negligible, but they need to know and be trained for in case they do. They're more likely to come across human trafficking. In fact, there's a good likelihood that they'll come across human trafficking, but they're not getting trained in it. But it's no good just training awareness. You know, this is what it looks like. This is, And we always train about awareness as to this is what a trafficked person looks like. Well, already we're in a way, you know, saying this is what a victim looks like when a victim could just look like any of us, could be quite a relaxed person because sometimes they don't know. But we should be learning more about this is venues where trafficking happens. This kind of indicates that trafficking has happened. Money flows. Uh, you know, one of the cases I investigated when we got some very light intelligence, we started to look at the air flights and we found that this group was booking one way tickets for women, you know, on air flights and coaches all coming from Eastern European countries. No return flights. All the women were of a certain age all paid for generally where they could by cash in these small little outlets. But then they started using credit cards. Then we looked at the finances and saw they had on one account, you know, one group, 49 flats in London. That is really serious organised. Just to have the numbers of people to go to those flats was enormous. They had to have, you know, two or three hundred women at least all the time. And so, you know, if we're looking at it, and we're not doing those things. If we think by setting up a number for people to ring or putting a poster up is going to prevent. And the first conference I did at the Vatican in 2014 at the Santa Marta group, I said, you know, one of the phrases I used was the fact that, you know, these traffickers are earning millions and they don't care what I say. They don't care even what the Pope says or any of us say, but they do care when somebody comes in at five o'clock in the morning and they end up getting a long time in prison and all their assets are taken 
they get quite emotional then, I said. And then we can give that money, and in the UK the law allows it, to the victims as reparation. But we're not seeing that happening. The legislation's there. The UK has risk orders and prevention orders to act before a crime happens, used very rarely. If I was still in those roles now, I'd be using them all the time. But who is asking the question? Why are they not being used? Why are we told all the time the legislation's no good? Why are we told victims, oh, they don't want to cooperate? We need to change that because we're planning failure. That is planning failure. You know, if you want to win, you go out and you say, we're going to do this. This is how we're going to do it. And you achieve. And if we look at the way the world is now, if we look at Ukraine and the way the world has become so unstable, and we saw the Europol reports today saying there has now been positive trafficking networks identified. You know, this is what we're up against. And we're not going to solve that by just raising awareness. I'm afraid we're going to have to engage and engage with the criminal justice system, but also prevention and hold those responsible and those systems responsible and those countries and those businesses who profit from it. This needs to be a crime that does not pay. And sadly, at the moment, it pays pretty well. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. No, it's a very powerful also uh, conclusion, I think.